Hi everybody, it's Linda Keane here and today I've got with me Beth Scalone who is a physical therapist from San Diego in California and uh, Beth is incredibly experienced uh, sort of well PT and aquatherapist and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy our little chat. So hi Beth. Hi Linda, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. I'm very good. And yourself? Great, great. Good, good, good. So Beth, I mean, I, I thought that we'd start off our little chat by saying that actually you and I met in 2007. And that was when I first came over and I did the first part of the Bedenko course with you. Yes, um, that was, we were both 10, right? And you came over. Yes, yes we're much younger. Yes. That's right, yeah. yeah, I came over with parental guidance. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did that course and of course uh, at that point I was at university myself. Mm -hmm. I needed to find a placement and was struggling to find a placement for my um, practical um, part of my degree and uh, reached out to you and you kindly said that I could come over and spend a month with you which I did in January 2008. So yeah, not, a, not a great time, not as ideal as far as our pool is outdoors and things. You've got, you got the, uh, the colder weather and you were working with the Padres as well, right? If I remember. Right. I did, yeah. yes. I spent part time with you and part time with the San Diego Padres, which was amazing. Um, fantastic experience, really. Well, yeah. it was a fantastic experience. I still remember some of the clients that I saw and, and mm -hmm some of the inspiring things that you did to help people and obviously to inspire me. And of course I did the second part of the Bedenko course with you whilst I was out there as well. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Do you want to sort of say a little bit about what Bedenko is and, and about that? Sure. Do? Yeah. So Igor Bedenko is um, uh, a uh, man, he's got a sports medicine degree. Um, he worked in Russia for years with the Russian uh, athletes and that kind of thing, and then came to the United States. And when he came to the, the United States, um, it was a time where we had like the gold gym and everybody was just building, you know, lifting weights and getting bulky and that kind of thing. And, and he was like, wait a minute, there's, there's all this other stuff, balance and coordination and flexibility. And then it's not just about lifting weights. And so um, he brought that and he also, he discovered the water um, through his father being ill and bringing his father to the water to rehab his water, his, his father. And um, I had the privilege of learning that when I was first out of school, my first job had a pool um, and they did it. And then I, he is back in, in the Boston area. So I was fortunate enough to, um, it was more prevalent there and I was able to train and do the, the certification and then train with him for a few days and be able to then share it. And um, and when you first do it, or when you, if you take a class, a certification class, it can be very um, actually high, feels high level um, as far as the exercises that we do, because it's a lot of sports, but all the principles can be applied to um, anyone across the board. So um, no matter what I do, those principles are probably all in my repertoire, even if I'm not teaching straight for Danko. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's great to have all the different tools in the toolbox, isn't it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Denko and a little bit of whatever. Um, so you said that uh, it from your first job. So what was your first job? So um, my first job as a physical therapist was at a clinic called the Center for Physical Therapy and Exercise in New Hampshire. Um, and it was an outpatient orthopedic clinic that had two sides. It had the therapy side and then it had the... Um, uh, exercise physiology sides. So we had exercise physiologists that would also work with people on a on a health basis. It was sort of a medical gym, if you will. Um, and then we had the pool and a great opportunity uh, to learn and work with these people. Um, and so that's where I started. And then I had done an internship in San Diego and was offered a job when I finished, but I wasn't quite ready to leave my family and all that. And after a year of being back in New Hampshire, I'm like, you know, I'm ready for a change. And that, that actually, uh, the um, offer was still available. So I graduated in 91. So at a time when um, there was a lot of need for therapists. So I came back out here and it's gonna be short term. And then I met my husband. So I've gotten to stay in this beautiful city. <laughs> it is beautiful. 
It doesn't rain except for at night. I remember that as well when I was there. Oh, it does rain, <laughs> but not as much, nearly as much as uh, the UK. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Um, okay, so how, how, what gave you the interest in working in the pool? You said about the Denko, but what initially sparked you to have that interest in the pool? Um, you know, I, I think part of it is as a, for, for um, us as, as physical therapists, um, to go to school, you have to do so many observation hours before you get into the programs. And partially the programs are limited to 40 to 60 students a year. So they want to make sure they graduate that many. So they want to make sure you want to be there. And one of my volunteer observation um, things was a summer with um, a therapist that happened to do the pool. So I think that's where I saw the benefits of the water and, and how great it was. I was never like a big swimmer or anything like that. It just happened to be, I saw the, the benefits and then I just happened, that first job had the pool, so I really liked it. And then when I came to San Diego, I happened to be the one with the pool experience. So if I was at a place that had a pool, I was the pool person, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. So did, was did you have to take an extra additional qualifications to work in the pool or was that just part of the physical therapy sort of original degree that you did right so good or bad um as a physical therapist as a licensed physical therapist i can do aquatic physical therapy it doesn't mean i do it well without extra training right so i could do it but if i i was i'm much more effective or any therapist is much more effective and efficient with what they do if they get that additional training so the schooling that i got and even now they might some schools might get a couple of hours of aquatic therapy intro like this is what it is and it's a little different than land and it doesn't it, you don't get the depth and breadth of what we really do so um it, it's fun to get students. I have a student right now and getting him in the pool, he looks at me and he's like, this is hard. And you know, just changing yeah. that mindset of what it can do. So um, I can do it, but I, uh, our therapist can do it, but, and I didn't need extra, but um, I felt like I, the more I learned, the better I am. Yeah, definitely. It's very much the same over here. It's, it's if you get a good placement as a physical mm -hmm. therapist, then you might get into the pool, but it's not generally offered as much as part of the degree. So, uh, does your, does the NIH have, um, that's what it's called, right? NIH, the National Health, um, National Health Service, yeah. Yeah. Is it uh, NHI? No. Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but is it something that, um, they have aquatic therapy for that or is it always sort of outside that realm for, for most of your, um, population? Um, they, <sighs> Unfortunately, a lot of the hydrotherapy pools are being shut down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really, really sad. But uh, some of the hospitals do have hydro pools in. Some of the private physiotherapists have pools that they can use. Um, it's not enough, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough, I think. Much as, I mean, I'm very, very blessed because the pool that I work at is attached to the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in London. Mm. Um, and uh, so we get a, a lot of spinal uh, people coming into the pool to rehab. So, but I think what would be really nice, I mean, it'll never happen and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, but I think every hospital over here should have a leisure centre attached to it. Because I agree. Yeah. people then, are more likely to come and do their rehab in the pool or in, even in the gym or anywhere else and then they'll carry on post recovery um so I, you know that's what i tend to see especially where i am which uh, as i say i'm very blessed very lucky <laughs> yeah definitely yeah definitely so so very similar actually on that aspect for the for the two countries which is great so I, kn I know as well, um, especially after last week, because we both spent time, well, last week, it was yesterday, spent yeah. <laughs> at uh, the ATRI conference. Um, I know that you've been part of the ATRI faculty for quite a while. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that journey? Sure. Um, I, um, that's kind of funny because with HRI, they, um, it's a multidisciplinary group. So it's wonderful because you, you have, um, 
uh, for me, I'm, you know, there's physical therapy, but you get so much more from working with people in all different industries and you can pull from different things and be, you know, uh, kind of bring that aspect in. But their major symposium, which was supposed to be in Florida, we did it via uh, the internet, um, yeah. was, um, is where they usually would try out new instructors. And so I don't, I, I, I think I thought, you know, I might like to try to teach. So I filled out the, the form and said, I have an interest in this class and gave all the details and they picked me and you did it. And if you didn't bomb terribly and you did a good job, then they often <laughs> would have you come back. And so it sort of evolved that way. Um, I personally, people are like, why do you do it? And I, and it's not for the money because, you know, it's really not a, um, a, uh, a windfall, right? It's more of a love of what you do, but it makes me a better therapist. It makes me a better um, uh, boss. It makes me a better everything um, because I'm looking things up and um, and I'm learning. Every time I teach a class, I walk away with something from one of my participants, which is awesome. So I just, I really, it kind of feeds my soul a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think I think anybody that gets involved with the ATRI group has has so much that they learn from each other as well as mm -hmm. to give to, to all the people, and it is lovely. And and you know the the Zoom aspect of things I think was phenomenal because people were so supportive. So that that was great as well. Um, so what when you're delivering sort of your courses, and I know you've been doing it for a few years now, what what is your favorite course do you think that you've delivered oh favorite that's topic. a hard one topic you know to I've, how's that topic to teach them. <laughs> yeah it, it is one of those things that um you know i've taught burdenko and i've taught uh therapeutic exercise and spine a lot because i see a lot of spine um but the aqua stretch when that came out um that's a really fun class. It's a challenging class to teach, as you know, because you teach it and you do a fabulous job. It's, it's that um, the light bulb really doesn't come on until the very end of the course, really, until people feel and do. And so it, it really um, challenged me to learn how to um, teach better and to explain things better and to put it in ways that everyone could understand and it made and it changed how I looked at things so maybe that's why I like it. it it I used to be an origin and search and just functional anatomy that's where the muscle goes and then when this whole fascia thing um sort of clicked on for me it was like oh I've got a whole new way of looking at and treating and and um seeing it evolve and seeing it evolve and in, in depending on who does it we all do it a little differently um, mm -hmm. and we're all effective and I think that's um, and it's a great another tool in the toolbox. So um, my favorite class is when people walk away and they, you know, they get it or they're like excited to use it and they help somebody else. So I think that's probably maybe because it's newer. But yeah, yeah, no, I quite agree. It's it's really really good to do that. Um, so what would you say then has been your biggest challenge? Ah, my biggest challenge. In general, or just like in the world of aquatics, or teaching? Uh, oh, well, there's three things there. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's do let's do uh, your biggest challenge with teaching, and your biggest challenge in your um, professional development. Right, so the, my biggest challenge in teaching is. Um, I end up, I tend to talk fast. I am, um, I grew up in New England, so I am a Yankee. I'm a little, you know, really fast talker. And um, sometimes I think I try to give too much information and too much um, material in one, and I, I get going and I don't give people the time to absorb and really integrate it and so i've been learning i've been trying to slow down and ask those reflective questions and see where i'm hitting the mark and where i'm not so i think that's one of uh, of a of a challenge when i'm teaching um i you know ruth um i find if i teach a 15 hour class easy peasy i got 15 hours and get plenty of information in time to Re regroup things and, and get it in. You give me an hour class and that's hard. That's hard to figure out what you want to put in one hour, right? It, it, you know, 
it seems like it would be easy, but it's not to, to stay organized and really get a point across and pick what you're going to do. So I think that's probably one of my biggest challenges is trying to figure out um, how to be most effective and not overwhelm and, and really give something of value. And then um, in, the, in the aquatic world, um, I've listened to some of these. I think we're all in that kind of same boat of um, maybe we're not taken as seriously. Um, you know, I have other other things that sort of give me um, credentials, so to speak, or clout in some in some world. So sometimes I'm brought into clinics. The clinic owner brings me in specifically to get the land and the water people together, and because of who I am in my background, the land people kind of pay attention to me a little bit more, but in general, it's, it's a challenge to really see the value. And we don't have enough therapy pools. I'm in San Diego and we don't have warm water pools. I use a, a health club pool that's 82 degrees. So I have a limit to who I can serve. And my big dream is to have my own place one day, which is scary, but, <laughs> um, you know, because when I travel and teach, I get into these gorgeous pools, these warm water pools that I get to use. And I'm like, oh, I so want this. So I think access for our clients for that ability and then just the awareness of it. Um, you know, people that love pool, love pool, and they're, they're dedicated to it, the clients. But then there's some people that have no idea. And doctors are just like, well, just go swim. That's oh, not what we do, you know. <laughs> that is one of my big, big bugbears is when the doctors say, go and have a swim. And you think, why don't you say, do you swim head up or head down? You know, because that makes a massive difference. Oh, yeah, you know, I swim and they, you see them craning yeah. their necks and compressing the vertebra and everything. You think, yeah. oh, the doctor told me to swim. No. But yeah. The only thing they say, you know if it's a knee replacement they might say don't do breaststroke but other than that people are just left to their own things <laughs> exactly oh, oh dear um how many hours a day do you reckon that you spend in a pool or how many hours a week if it's not daily yeah so it varies during the year in the summer um it increases so we have um i have um there's five I got to count the chairs. I can never remember how many there you'd think I'd be able to remember. But um, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. There's six of us that treat, including myself. And um, in the summer, there were probably more like uh, 30 to 40 percent is pool, and then the rest is land. And depending on what's going on, um, I may be um, doing three to 10 hours a week in the pool now. It used to be a lot more when we were on site, when we were, our pool is on site. Now we're kind of, we're off site and then we, we use the pool. Um, and so it varies. And as you know, when I do the Burdenko and they're doing deep water, I'm actually on deck because I can see better, they can see me and they don't need me there. Um, and then otherwise I'm, you know, in the water with them. And that's sort of evolved over time too. So um, it increases in the pool. I would, I think if I had a place, if I had it on site, um, we might be more 50-50, you know, because there'd be outdoors, we have the sun or the cold. So we have people both ways. We share space with the public. Um, right now it's nice because the public's not allowed in, but we are. So we have this big, beautiful pool that's a lot quieter. Um, but in the normal summer, we have 250 kids. So my patients get good balance challenges because you have the turbulence going on in the water. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it varies. It's nice actually to hear that you are in amongst the public. because So many people think you can only do the therapy stuff in a, a private pool or where, when you're the only people in. But I work with the public around as well. So. Mm -hmm does work you can make um yep. you, know, you can be successful you can be um get the right results and everything even with the public around so right so it's, it's yeah. lovely to hear you say that as well but um do you do any sort of like group work or is all your work one-to-one -one? mine's pretty much one-to-one -one, um in part because we share space um and with a health club pool there they have people that provide like the water aerobics classes and that kind of thing um and um so if uh you know um so i'm i'm much more a one-on-one -on -one. and as um i'm a little different our clinics a little different than a lot of mainstream clinics in the united states which i wouldn't say all of them but we don't use um 
techs. Um, it's all licensed therapists and it's all one-on-one -on -one for 45 minutes to an hour versus having three or four patients at a time. Um, and we've been able to keep that um, quality up. A lot of places are forced because of whatever insurance they take or that kind of thing to have that group. And that can be very effective. It's not ineffective. It's just how I chose and how I prefer to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. So what's your, um, I'm going to say, what's your biggest challenge? What sort of condition, I suppose, do you find the most difficult to, to sort of work within the pool? What's, what creates the biggest challenges? Oh, geez. You know, I guess if somebody's fearful of the water, that's a big challenge because um, mm. just getting somebody to relax first is something. And, and um, it's funny how many patients will come and they'll be like, do I have to get, the doctor has specifically prescribed aquatic therapy or something. And they'll come and they'll be like, well, do I have to get in the pool? I, I'm afraid of the water. I hate the water. And I'm like, well, didn't you tell the doctor this when he was going to send you? And, no, you know. And um, I try to convince them if I really feel they're going to benefit. I say, you know, I just give me two or three sessions. If after that, you don't feel the benefit. You're not, I will call the doctor and we'll see if we can change you to land or we'll, we'll switch it up. Um, but I think that person that's hesitant or has opinions, like the person that comes in and says, this isn't gonna work, nothing's worked, right? You know, um, so that, that mindset is probably the first challenge. And then after that, um, I'm trying to think, you know, I've seen anywhere from people with spinal cord injuries which is a very rewarding um, per, per, uh, population to work with because they get in the water and once they are comfortable flipping themselves over and knowing they can breathe without somebody being there, they just like swim away from you. They're like, I'm free, you know? Um, and then, um, so that's probably um, the biggest challenge. But my, I guess more, more for my, me is the mindset when I have to do a lot of convincing and, and working with them to embrace the pool and, and see the benefits. And that does take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but that with persistence, they can benefit. And that person that was the grumpy old guy that started and later is joking with you and is back to doing things, that's kind of so worth it, right? Absolutely. Definitely. I'm not I think I agree with you. It's, it's sort of the first time I've thought about it in that way is to have the sort of the mental challenge as being the biggest challenge, but it is because it's not, you know, that aspect isn't really our area of expertise and it's not something that, I mean, I don't know about yourself when you did your initial training. I mean, we did um, a sort of psychology one. 101. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one semester, it covers it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same as nutrition, you know, one semester covers it all. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it is, I think it's, you have to sort of really get your head round and be able to sort of use all the correct words and the correct language for these people. So. Um, okay, so, so that was your biggest challenge. What do you think has been the greatest success? What's been your, the bit most rewarding thing? <laughs> You know, there's a, a very specific person in mind, and that's because um, John was somebody that came to me probably after the first two years of me starting my own practice. And um, he was a young man um, who um, was in a car accident and ended up with um, a um, being um, quadriplegic. And it was an incomplete, so he had some use of his hands and things, but um, he came to me, he went through rehab, and he was told to go home and get used to the electric wheelchair. And um, he, and it's interesting because he had two other um, friends that he had made in rehab that also ended up working with us in the pool. And that's how his, his mother um, found us. And she drove him an hour each way, wow. uh, four days a week to work with us in the beginning. And he went from the electric wheelchair to the push wheelchair to a walker to lost strand crutches or forearm crutches. And that was like each year I got to take away an assistive device. And we, we made it up to the crutches and then his joints would, would not have tolerated the way he was, um, yeah. had lack of some of that muscle activation. But he was, well, he was kind of a punk kid when he showed up because he was a teenager injured. So imagine that, um, all those things, but just the sweetest and the, his family, 
they never gave up. They never said, okay. And they just, they did it and they did what they had to do. And um, I worked with him until he died tragically um, about 18 years later. So um, he was a little brother to me. And I mean, he has a, a very um, uh, special place in my heart because it really showed how you could, you could, the water, the power of the water to get him um, much more functional. So, you know, after a few years, he drove himself to therapy um, and that kind of thing. So I think uh, um, he, he's somebody that uh, I will always remember. Yes, yeah. Yeah, very special, very special. I think to see, you know, to, to go through that amount of changes from, and it's very frustrating when the medical profession say, oh, get used mm -hmm. to being in an electric wheelchair, that's it. It's, yeah, heart, heartbreaking, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty damn good success story as well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's obviously, um, you know, we've both been in the industry for quite a long time, um, you know, since we were younger than 10 years of age. Cause yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were obviously born in the winter, um, but the industry's changed a lot in, in our time, mm -hmm. and time and everything. So what are some of the the things that you think have changed has changed and maybe for the better or maybe that you'd like to see improve mm -hmm. well in my world it's an insurance-based reimbursement world and so that that pendulum has swung far and wide um through different things and um i've seen a lot of hospital-based pools close and that's just tragic because um hospitals serve a population often that's lower in socioeconomic background because of the reimbursement rate. So there's a population that may not have a community pool for access or even swim lessons, right? So I think that that's kind of, um, it's sad to see because it's based on revenue, not what you can bring to the community. I mean, granted, I'm in business, I have to stay in business, yeah. but you know, yeah. there's that, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of the, the sadness that I've seen in, in some of it because of, of um, uh, reimbursement and or how to pay for things. And, um, but what I've seen um, on the other side is um, a variety of different techniques. I mean, we're, we've gone from, you know, just the kind of Jane Fonda water aerobics, right? Or, or water aerobics like Jane Fonda on land. Um, yeah. And then we've got the aqua stretch, we've got the Brutenko method, we have all the different uh, things that uh, ATRI have brought together. Um, people are starting to realize that what we learned on land, a lot of those techniques can be applied to the water. You just take the properties of the water into account. You know, yeah. that it, um, it's not just swimming, um, that kind of thing. There's a lot of... Um, in physical therapy, it's starting to, in the United States, it's starting to be seen as a specialty a little bit more. Um, the American Physical Therapy Association's um, Academy for Aquatic Physical Therapy, which is what used to be the aquatic section, um, now has a certificate program as well um, and sort of geared to those new grads that have not had experience so they get some of that more detailed knowledge. So I think the recognition that we need that extra training to be good and to be effective and to be efficient um, is is important. So I think that's um, a step in the right direction. Um, and patients are a little more uh, proactive, I think. Um, people seek me out. They, I say, you know, we ask, how did you hear about us? And they're like, I wanted water. So I looked up water therapy. So although it's a smaller population, the people that do it love it and yeah. have value. They're all loyal, I think. They're very yeah. loyal, aren't they? So. Yeah. Once we've got them in there, they yeah, want them to stay. <laughs> Very much so. Definitely. Cool. Lovely. So, what when you're in the pool, what sort of equipment do you like to use with your patients? Yeah, you know, I we have buoyant equipment, drag force equipment. Um, I I always uh, I always try to figure out what to do with the pool noodle um, because in San Diego you can get one year round. And it's about two bucks, maybe five bucks if you get the thicker, fancier one with a shark head on it or something. But um, so for the pure um, uh, 
flexibility of it, if you will, the things you can do with it for somebody to be able to do it at home. I like that. Um, I really do like some of the Aqualogic drag force bells and, and fins. They're comfortable to wear. They don't have a lot of torque around the wrist. So I think those being developed have been a nice adjunct, especially for that heavy, the strengthening phase in using drag force. Um, you know, I'm a I, Burdenko guru, so a lot of the barbells and the belts and the deep water stuff, I still use that in the Wonder Board. And it, so I didn't really, I don't have one that I always go to. I'm kind of, I kind of, I must have ADD because I don't, I get bored. I don't like to do the same thing <laughs> every time. So I'm like, oh, let's try this and let's do this. So kind of sometimes um, it's hard on my notes because I don't do the same thing every time. Uh, with somebody so yeah how about you what do you use <laughs> well yeah you see it's i mean in some aspects i'm much the same it's the right piece of equipment for the right job um mm -hmm. you know over here the swimming pools they've got the noodles because they can be multi-purpose they can go for swimming lessons they can go for the aquarobics and things like that so you'll find that there's noodles there um, most pools now have got dumbbells as well, as long as they've got different sizes and that, that's fine. Um, I've got my own pieces of kit. I've got this sort of like the wonder board and I've got again, the, the bells. Um, and I, I quite like the, they've got the new, um, like a di Dyna, do you call them Dyna bands, Thera bands? Yes. The, the brighter, the brighter band. I love that too. That new one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, things like that, I, I, I like those. And I'm also finding that now um, I've put my head in a, in a slightly different place because I'm, I'm tending to think now post-COVID-19, I, I will be encouraging people to buy their own equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got to now start thinking also on something that will fit in somebody's swimming bag. So I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm trying to, to think, well, that's bulky. Can we use that instead? Or the, and again, the sort of the TheraBand type things are, mm -hmm. you know, are very easy to put if, as long as you get the ones, cause we've got a company called, over here called Meglio and they do a, a water resistant band, which is very good. So okay. very good for going in, um, maybe the mitts, you know, something that can sort of go in with the swimming costume and the towel uh, that sort of becomes their personal equipment. And then they, would, they don't have to sort of leave them aside and think, well, has someone touched that? Has it been disinfected? You know, so yeah. I'm sort of like, try, I'm trying to think down that route for going forward mm -hmm. as to where we're going as we... That's a great idea. I mean, yeah. I think that that's a, an important uh, thing to consider. Um, you know, we know that chlorine and, and all of that is going to kill most of what we, we, we don't need, uh, the CDC has said that, that they don't believe that the, you can, that the, you can contract COVID from the pool water itself, but all the surfaces that people touch are still the things that we have to be concerned about. So um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and uh, you know, if it, it makes them a little more vested if they have purchased, even if it's not that expensive, but they, they purchased it, they're like, oh, that's staring at me. Maybe I should use that. Yeah. And something <laughs> like that, you know, some of those bands with the um, a bit, I'm actually going to go and get one. Hey, Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, here we yeah. go. <laughs> so I think this this one is a bit like your rider one, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like the rider band, except it's a different company. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's a different company. But I th I think with something like this, then that can easily go into somebody's bag. Easily. Absolutely. But it also they can use it on land as well. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. them with their homework like you're saying you know they're looking at it and saying well maybe i should do my homework but yeah. you know if it was sort of like an ankle they could even put it on in and stand in a bar mm -hmm. and and do some exercises so I, I i i do like this these new pieces of kit that's going out i mean we've also oh this is the other one that we've got this is the one i was just saying okay but, yeah and this is what uh, sort of like chlorine resistant as well yeah you know and it doesn't stick to itself like no. you know so do they sell that 
can I buy that? Because right now we have to wipe down our therabands between patients and it's hard to get stuck. And yeah. I need my latex free stuff works, but I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. Company. You can. Yeah. Meglio. Awesome. Meglio. Okay. Perfect. Meglio. There we go. A little bit of free advertising. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's under the massage bed. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Where are we going? Where are we going now? <laughs> 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 Done our favourite piece of kit and wine. Um, okay. So I think uh, we have one more question, and that is, if you ever retire, what would you like to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's funny um, because I started when I was 10. Um, <laughs> the older we get, that that changes. And I have realized in the last couple of years that I really hope that I'm remembered for inspiring and sharing knowledge and wanting people to be better and continue to do more. Um, I, don't, I don't think that I've invented anything new. I'm not... I think I've been able to share and put it in a light that makes it worthwhile for people. That's kind of what I hope people say. Oh yeah, I really learned something and I was really inspired to continue to learn. So that's kind of, yeah. I guess what I hope. Well, I've learned um, from you over the years. Definitely. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I, you know, I think we all learn from each other. You know, Terry had said something the other day to me and I said, well, um, half of what, you know, a lot of that came from you when I took your classes or, you know, sharing in um, the hip class together and kind of drawing on your knowledge. I think that that's one of the beauties is, um, there, at least in ATRI, there's less ego involved and a lot more sharing. Yeah, yeah um, that, is, that is something I think definitely ATRI is, is the, um, the most sort of family orientated and welcoming out of all mm -hmm. the the other conferences that I think I've attended so which is lovely um yeah. okay uh I don't think I've got anything else to ask you and Any, anything else you can think of to to finish up um, no I hope that we all get um that everybody just learns from our experience with what we're going through now. And I think we're all gonna be better when we're on the other side of it. We'll have new tools and new, new techniques and new ways of communicating um, that will meet the needs of even more people. We might you know, keep some of the virtual as well as the, the on-site. And when we get back together, I, um, I think that'll be great. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in person again someday and uh, yeah. um, being able to travel again, so. <laughs> Yeah, well, Virgin have kept my flight for next year, so mm -hmm. next year, and hopefully bringing a few of the Brits with me as well. So yeah, that would be great. You are the good, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so other than that, I think I think I've uh, exhausted the questions for you for now. I'm sure okay, great. there's some others, so uh, you might be hearing from us again. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was nice to, to chat with you. And uh, um, I love what you're doing. You know, you're bringing so much to the UK and spreading that word. So I think that's just uh, awesome. Um, and all the research and the things that you've done are just amazing. So um, keep that up because it's a big force. I'm, I'm hopefully going to have some really exciting research coming next year where I put the ultrasound in the pool and I'm ultrasounding in, in the water. And so uh -huh. hopefully that will be uh, coming, coming up ATRI's ways next year. So Yes, I look forward to hearing about that. Definitely. Yeah, very interesting, actually. Very interesting, the stuff I've found. So. Cool. Lovely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest. You're of welcome. Uh, Thank you. You too. <laughs> I'll hopefully catch up with you again soon. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, stop.